Hi, I am Maria Drushkova of Natural Mask, interviewing three experienced mass circle leaders about their craft. General Barrow of the Marines said, amateurs talk about tactics, but professionals study logistics. In this video, the leaders talk about their logistics for the circles. I find that you really need to have at least five or six students to have it really be collaborative in a conversation where people, everybody has their different roles in the group and one person's going to suggest this thing and the other person's going to be the naysayer and the other person's going to sit there and say nothing and then ten minutes later say aha and whatever their different roles are. So, um, so getting enough students sometimes is an issue. It depends on the age group. We do different age groups. Some age groups it seems like there's a lot of kids but some there aren't. And um, Another another thing that's um, a, a worry is paying paying for it because um, I need to get paid for this work, so we need to have students enough to pay me as well. And there's there are some grants out there for um, math circles, especially for startup math circles. Um, although this year, now that we're four years in, our math circle didn't get um, a like startup slash continuation grant. So this year, that's a bigger bigger worry for me now. Um, even more so than ever. So, so you say, well, and yes, with a small circle, it's almost harder to get enough people because you cap it at a certain way. Right, right. As opposed to advertising widely for hundreds of people, you have to keep it small, but then sometimes you get too small, right? That's right. Like we, we typically say our cap would be 12. I've done it a couple of times with 13. Um, because any, any more than, say, 12, for the kind of exploration that we're doing, it's really no longer a conversation where everybody can be involved. Um, All right. So, so what, what do you find these kids then? When uh, do you find them? We find, well, we started out finding them out in through the homeschooling community because Talking Stick is a... Um, learning center that's primarily for homeschooled students. They do things during the day um, while most kids are at school. But we also have had an on online presence as well. So for the first for the first year almost all of the kids were homeschoolers and then there were a few school kids whose parents had found us online just by knowing about math circles and dreaming that someday there might be a math circle in Philadelphia. And then over the years um, Word of mouth has spread about it, and we've um, ended up. By last year, we had a pretty sizable poor population of our, say, eight to nine year olds um, who were school students, too. It was probably about half and half, although this year we're back to so far all homeschoolers because one thing I didn't anticipate was that in Philadelphia, in fifth grade, in the public schools, the academics really ramp up. A lot of kids go off to academic magnet schools, and now those kids um, who went to school who've been coming to Mass Circle for the past few years aren't anymore. Mm -hmm. So uh, you mentioned you get grants, so when uh, and you do charge students for attending, right? Yeah. Yeah. How, how, how much do you charge? That's something a lot of beginner circle leaders ask because they don't know how to price it. Yeah, that was hard. So when I, I we started out, I did research on what other um, what other circles charge, and um, our circle charges um, between eighteen and twenty dollars a session. We do them in six week sessions. I think right now we're charging twenty a session, so it would be one twenty for a six week session. And we prorate it more or less depending if those sessions are longer, we have more of them, or they're shorter for younger kids. And what I found was that um, that price was really kind of like right in the middle of what people doing circles were charging. People who were doing huge circles with say 30 kids or more were charging less than that. And then some circles with um, strong reputations and have been around for a long time um, that do them in smaller groups charge a little more than that but I think we're just kind of right in the middle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, you said you you have six week sessions. You meet once a week, right? For how long? We typically meet for an hour 
Um, and I, with older kids, we've been, the middle schoolers and high schoolers, we've been doing an hour and a quarter, an hour and a half. Um, and no matter what, what we do, the kids always want it to be longer. But <laughs> there, are, there are all kinds of other constraints all the time. That are um, do, you, do you always meet at the same place? Yes, we do. So it's that center that first invited you, right? right. Yes. Mm -hmm. The the talking stick center. Correct. Mm -hmm. And um, um, that this fears you have about well ahead, uh, I guess. Uh, um, how 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 does it relate to how you do things? That I the the way you find uh, content or the desire to have a large enough group to talk. So how, how do you plan for these things to happen in your circles, for, to, 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 to do good things like that? So the one thing that comes to mind in terms of how the fear of low enrollment affects how we do things is with the course offerings that we do. Because there are kids of almost every age who want to do math circles, starting with four and five year olds, going up to like, you know, ninth grade, tenth grade, and I'm the only person doing it, and I have other things going on, so I can afford to do it one hour a week forever. So so we offer these six week courses, then we switch the age and do another six week course, and then we do another six week course. But then last year, there were certain age groups that we really struggled with finding kids, particularly um, teenagers. Um, and in the past, we made each math circle all, all year long be for a different age so that we could service everybody. And then I realized it's we have a really hard time finding teenagers. We can usually get about five, and then typically one or two will be absent. So it's really awkward. Um, so I just we decided to not offer a math circle for teens this year. And because that group that in the past had been around eight or nine-year-olds was so big where we we're practically turning people away. We decided to offer that twice this year. So we're doing that right now, and then we're going to do that again in the spring. And that was before I anticipated that a lot of those kids were going to have a shift this year in their academic priorities. So, Okay. There are different types. Okay. Um, when I do it with elementary school kids, um, lately I've been going into classrooms, into formal classrooms, and sort of... Um, <laughs> dissolving the formality. The teacher is there. I want the teacher to learn some of these things and get the idea of what it's like to do these activities. I have a whole class or half a class, so it's it's large, 15 or even 30 kids. So that constricts some of the things I, I can do, um, but on the other hand, I get a lot of data from what I'm doing. I can see that they're working. Um, the kids I'm working with now are in a gifted program, but they're not severely gifted. They're just very motivated. Some of them are gifted in areas other than mathematics, so you get a real spread of um, of students. Um, I come in. <laughs> I'll tell you the best times, and I'll tell you the worst times. The best time is in March or April when the kids are preparing for these damn standardized tests and mathematics means going over the test and over the test and over the test and the kids are good at this so they are bored and it's like um, did you make a mistake did you make a mistake you know um, it's 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 nitpicking and they hate it so when I come in they love it because suddenly it's a different kind of math and, and they and they like the things that I'm doing um, lately I've been working on stuff which is sort of proto, this is for third and fourth grade, proto computer science, sort of digital type things, things that you can um, you can record as ones and zeros. And I have them act it out. I have them count to 20 in binary by standing up and sitting down on, on seats. Um, I can do the whole class by um, having a race, how quickly can you count up, uh, all kinds of things like this. Um, uh, all right, so what are the bad times? Well, the bad, I'll tell you what the bad times are. I only have an hour. Sometimes the activity takes two hours. So there's a way of, um, I tried this, and I'm not sure I'm going to continue it. I have to find a way of making it fit. Um, Martin Gardner 
in the 50s devised this game you can play and you can get a computer to play it and you can what happens is <clears throat> as the computer plays it it gets better at it you can even do this with tic-tac-toe this is a, a computer science standard thing <clears throat> but I tried with this with the kids they loved the game they were good at the game and then we started working on the computer which is um, beans on a piece of paper um, but the trouble was that it did it took too long and I'm not sure how I'm going to make it easier but that's the kind of thing that 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 you have to try and and work with and if you fail the kids still loved it they loved playing the game they loved the concept of a computer that played the game even if they didn't get to the end of the thing uh, all right finances who gives money to my program where do I when I spend it well right now I'm in a very good position I'm funded by a, uh, a private foundation to do this work to do it in the public schools to train these community workers and so on to do it um, when I was teaching in the in the suburban school the parents paid me um, I've had situations where I know other people where the school would pay you to do something after school um, there are different models um, the issue is what are the resources that the students have if the students have parents who can afford to pay for this afterwards you just make a nominal fee and you go and pay and by the way it's cheap for them because if you have seven or eight kids um, if they're paying ten dollars a session it's not a lot for them but it's 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 enough for you um, but some there are many populations that don't have ten dollars a session and then you have to find a way of doing it either find an outside organization that can help that would be a great thing there are um, in many places there are local foundations or charities who are dying to do something with math and with schools um, and if the default thing to do is um, homework help and test prep that's what they see because that's all they see math as and if you come to them with something more exciting if you show them these exciting things have them do one one or two activities frequently they will say oh this is great how can we get into the schools and then you say here's a curriculum here's a here's here's a structure it's been tried other places um, uh, we have people who do it for so much per hour and maybe you'll get some money the point is that local funding is sometimes very uh, much easier to get than national or, or, or um, funding from a, from a larger institution I haven't seen that happen New York City doesn't count it's too big that's where I, that's where I work it's too big um, well actually the foundation I'm, who's, who's funding me is doing it for that reason to be a corporate a good corporate citizen in New York City um, but it would be great if that happened around the country if that became something that 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 was done and I think it could happen so uh, again for us we have a math studio program that's sort of in the background allowing us to have our master goals um, work I guess so our math studio program is a little bit of every everything it's got homework tutoring math enrichment classes and uh, other science kinds of science uh, technology engineering um, programming activities and um, we have everybody from kindergarten through high school students in that program and um, it's at the Charles Martin Center twice a week people can just drop by um, so that program helps us to uh, find groups of students who want to do a um, deeper um, in exploration so a lot of the students come to that program first and then maybe at the first at the beginning they aren't quite ready to do a math circle but later on they become ready through that program and so as soon as we get a group of like-minded students who you know could do a could do have a discussion together then we bubble off math circles from there sometimes the math circles are actually um, go into that program and sometimes they meet separately it just depends on um, what will work for everybody so that program is uh, like an after-school program it's right? actually in the evening it's 530 to 8 twice a week but it's like an after-school program mm -hmm. so it's uh, it sounds similar to to that pirate shop Eggers has and 
um, to some other programs that are ongoing. And mm -hmm. uh, what does the fee for that, if you don't mind me asking? It's, it's free. All free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but you said that uh, supports you financially, or did I not understand it right? No. <laughs> No, the, the the programs for children cost money. The programs for uh, for teachers bring in money. Uh huh. So, uh, can you talk about the programs for teachers? Um, yeah, those are again those bring in money for our center. Um, we uh, there is a desperate need for professional development in mathematics right now, right. and uh, especially because of the new standards all over mm -hmm. the country and. The fact that the, the textbooks don't actually help a teacher to teach those. All right. And uh, so they have to first understand what the standards are and then understand how a person, you know, how, how can you do lessons that will get at that, and then they have to create those lessons. So it's a lot of knowledge that's required. I think, I mean, just estimating for third and fourth grade teachers, they need about 40 hours of PD to get on, just understand what those standards are saying. Mm -hmm. And fifth and sixth grade means about 80 hours. Um, K2 is a lot less. It's more like 10. But um, that's th that's how much is required just to get them to the point where they understand the content in a deep enough way to teach it. And then they have to come up with the lessons. So there's a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. And um, the local districts have funding to um, ha to provide some of this professional development. They don't have a lot, but they have a little and um, there are also a lot of state grants and other kinds of grant funded programs that come through various universities that um, are designed at um, giving teachers that training in the summer and we participate in those as well so um, that's all of the funding from our programs essentially comes from that. We've had a few grants in the past. Um, the Flum Foundation was um, generous uh, enough to fund our math studio program for one year which was fabulous. It allowed us to expand it that year, offer it more days of the week. Um, and we've had other local foundations that have been able to help us uh, a couple times, but those are pretty short-lived and they don't, they're do not they not sustainable. Mm -hmm. so, so you meet for the studio uh, twice a week, and how about the circles? How often do they meet? How long does it last? Um, you say 10 week uh, sessions, how, how long usually, is each session? It's usually a semester, um, mm -hmm. something on the order of 10 sessions. Oh, is it weekly? Yes, usually once a week. Okay, and um, oh, where do you all meet? Uh, do you have the same place or do you go to different places? It's usually at the Charles Martin Youth Center now, because that's our base of operations, but we have met in local libraries. Um, and when we first got started, we didn't have any space of our own. So um, we went to a boys and girls club and actually did this process there with the kids. We just brought mathematical poly, you know, polydrons and other kinds of mathematical toys and then tried to engage the students in deeper questions and sort of a free-for-all um, com you know, playroom that they had, mm -hmm. and then we would suck the students in to um, spontaneous math circles on the side, um, as chance allowed. And chance allowed quite a bit. They, the kids were really excited about it. So um, we would end up all sort of a cluster of kids would gather around the whiteboard out of that, and that was a little more. Um, like I said it's, it was a little more organic because the kids were already just there, and it was easy enough. Um, we moved away from that one though because other students couldn't come in. So mm -hmm. we weren't able to serve um, as broad an audience as we wanted to. In the next video in the series, the leaders talk about short and sweet activities they used to introduce their flavor of mathematics to new people.